I'm John Batchelor. This is the John Batchelor Show. Winter, 1902, February 4th, West 23rd Street, New York. A man named Comstock, a burly man, three, three others with him, crash into a small and, at this point, penurious apartment of an intellectual and a heroine and a, a seer, but also a victim. Her name is Ida Craddock. Ida Craddock is at the center of a romantic and completely unpredictable new book, Heaven's Bride, The Unprintable Life of Ida C. Craddock, American mystic, scholar, sexologist, martyr, and madwoman. Lee Eric Schmidt, who is a history professor, he's the Charles Warren Professor of American Religious History at Harvard University. Of course, I accuse him of being a PhD. Lee, a very good evening and congratulations. Who is Comstock to break into this young woman's room, she's 45 years old, and confiscate her two publications, The Wedding Night and Right Marital Living? Who is Comstock? Right. Well, he's, uh, he's in charge of the New York Society for the Suppression of Vice, which uh, had uh, gained its, its power in 1873 through what was known as the Comstock Act, which uh, made him a special agent of the U.S. Post Office, which may not sound like much, but... It was a, an incredibly effective way to monitor uh, the distribution of publications and just be, it's a, you know, we hear it as it has this federal reach, and he's able to um, uh, track uh, what he sees as obscene materials all over the country. So he's a super cop. He's like the J. Edgar Hoover of Vice. <laughs> he, is, he is like a super cop. That's right. I mean, by, by 1902, he's, he's had 2,000-plus convictions. He's confiscated 38 tons of uh, obscene publications and destroyed about a million uh, uh, indecent photographs and pictures. So he's, so when he shows up there in 1902 at Craddock's apartment, he's already just hauled away massive amounts of material from all kinds of different people and taking her uh, small collections of pamphlets and any other uh, scandalous books he might have found in her library. You know, it's not much of a haul. But what's interesting is, um, you know, just how inflamed this particular episode becomes. I mean, how it, be, how it distills the sort of, all of the uh, conflicts that have, have arisen through his, his super cop powers. Right. Um, Here it is, 1902. Teddy Roosevelt is now President Roosevelt for the accident or the crime of the assassination of Mr. McKinley. So it is the dawn of the 20th century. Uh, progressivism is some years away. Uh, the enlightened understanding of marriage is just peeking through. And uh, this pamphlet, The Wedding Night and Right Marital Living, uh, they've, they've stung her in a mail order. Uh, you, you speculate that she mailed it to a uh, customer in New Jersey who might have been Comstock himself. So this was all a very much of a setup. But reading just quotes from The Wedding Night, we're talking about manuals that you would give to a teenager or someone for sex education here a uh, hundred years later. Right. I mean, that, that's what she thought she was doing. I mean, she was trying to create uh, these, these, yeah, these manuals for sex education. She thought they would be helpful for people on, on the verge of marriage. They'd know more about their bodies, know more about... Uh, know more about what marriage was like in, in, in lots of different ways. And so that's what she saw herself as doing. That's what these little pamphlets were about. And, um, and so she saw herself as really in league with medical doctors. Often those medical doctors who, who liked her would refer people to her for her counseling. So she really saw herself in that kind of role as a marriage counselor or a advisor about sexuality. And... Uh, yeah, so that's that's what's getting hauled away. I mean, she, there aren't there aren't pictures, there are diagrams. No, there's just uh, they're, they're they're her prose, and she's uh, she's never been married, and she may or may not have had affairs, but in any event, she's a reformer, she's a campaigner, and yet Comstock represents the power of the courts. She's charged in New York courts, uh, New York Court of Special Sessions. She's also charged several days later by a grand jury with a federal crime. And they mean to persecute her and destroy her. So we better go back to the beginning, Lee, of who she is. She's born in 1857. Her name is Ida Craddock. And her father dies when she's two years old. They're Quakers. What does that mean in Philadelphia in the 1860s and 70s when she's growing up? Well, what that means for her in particular, she's identifying with a pretty liberal strand among the Quakers. So you think of the abolitionist reformers, the 
the advocates of women's rights. It's, it's that strand of a kind of progressive Quakerism um, that she particularly lines up with. Not all Quakers are like that by any means in Philadelphia. They're uh, ones that think that Quakers should only marry Quakers and really stay close to their communities. And so they're much more orthodox and traditional. But that's not the variety she's involved in. She goes to a uh, Quaker school there in Philadelphia, Friends it's Central. Still there. Friends Central is still, still a very, still very popular, very successful at the edge of what is now the city line. So it's just at the ed- on the other side of the city limits. That, that's right. So it's still there and still, still flourishing. And, uh, and so she, she gets her education there, and it, it's a good secondary education. And, uh, and so, I mean, one of the things it also means is it, it gives her a real sense of, of being an activist, of speaking her mind about these issues that she thinks are unjust or in some ways oppressive. And she often credits that frankness, that candor that she takes with her uh, into these sex reforms, these marriage reform work, with that Quaker upbringing. And and Quakerism at the time, Lee, is it seen as um, a more enlightened, or in this part of Quakerism, more enlightened than the Presbyterianism and the Methodism of the time in the same area? Uh, Yeah, it would be seen as having more of these progressive reformers uh, and... uh, yeah, and there, in this particular strand, there are a lot of uh, uh, kind of social misfits. Walt Whitman grew up listening to the founder of uh, Elias Hicks, who was the founder of this strand of the Quaker tradition, and found him mystical and very inspiring. So, yeah, I think I think you would see them as uh, you know on on the whole uh, to the left, I guess, of of most of the Methodists and Presbyterians. Of course, she doesn't stay there; she keeps moving on right. uh, as well, and she ends up with Unitarians eventually and beyond that. And, and the Unitarians she ends up with, she thinks, are the, you know, the most liberal progressive church in all of Philadelphia. And they were after the war, and, and she's very aggressive. And I got the feeling in reading what you write about her that she was gifted. She was a gifted reader and a gifted young woman who was frustrated because she couldn't go to college. This is about the, the time that all the women's schools we now know are famous, Vassar and Bryn Mawr and Holyoke and Smith, are being founded in this same 20-year period. Right. She wants to go to Penn, and they turn her away. Right, I and mean, this is her first entry into really reform work. She thinks she's going to make it her mission to open the University of Pennsylvania, its College of Liberal Arts, to women. And so from 1882 to 1884, she petitions them repeatedly. She even finally gets uh, the faculty to administer the uh, admissions exam to her. She passes it, same exam that would have been uh, administered to male candidates. Then the faculty actually votes on a narrow vote to admit her, that case goes to the trustees, and the trustees say, wait a minute, <laughs> and decide to you know, put off the admission of women to the college. So, so she gets very close to cracking pen open uh, to women in that, in, in, at that point, but, if, but doesn't. She fails, and then, of course, women aren't admitted to pen for another half century into the college. So, so this, is a, this is a crucial moment of uh, frustration and failure for her um, to be to have come that close uh, to getting into Penn and really feeling like it was her rightful place to be. Idocratic, and, Idocratic is uh, a very easy person to get to like in Lee's book, Heaven's Bride. She's a blue stocking. That's another term that was used in this period. She goes on to teach stenography at Girard College, but what's ahead of her is Comstock and Comstockism and the persecution of the presumed uh, right thinking of the late 19th century. And when we come back... Idocratic takes on Comstockism and uh, belly dancing in the 1890s. Heaven's Bride is the book. I'm John Batchelor. This is The John Batchelor Show. I'm John Batchelor. This is The John Batchelor Show. I'm continuing my conversation with Lee Eric Schmidt, who is an historian and who would be accused by the James brother, that would be William James, of being well, part of the octopus of PhDs. That was the essay that William James published late in the 19th century because at this point, the whole idea of academic interdisciplinary 
uh, thinking is being born, uh, sometimes called today comparative religion, also sociology, anthropology, and Ida Craddock has a gift for that. But remember, she's been turned away from being a PhD, from being a scholar, from being given a, an academic uh, pursuit. And so she invents herself. And Lee, that's what I most like about her. She's self-invented. You even say she has an episode in San Francisco where she tries to make it, uh, make herself in the world. Right, yeah. She, she is very good at, at continuing to invent and reinvent herself. I mean, even when turned away from Penn, to not give up at that point uh, and still to imagine herself in her own way as pursuing this scholarly work. I mean, she... She traipses around uh, to, from library to library, the main uh, libraries, anything. She can Library of Congress, Library Company in uh, Philadelphia. Um, for a time, she's in London and, you know, the British Museum, British Library, uh, studying away there. Yeah, so she, so she keeps pursuing that and then uh, reinvents herself in this, in this role of the, the marriage reformer or sexologist and reinvents herself as, as a pastor when, of course, there aren't that many women who can claim to be pastors, and she's claiming to be a pastor of something called the Church of Yoga. And uh, so, yeah, this is, uh, she has a great facility it's for self-invention, uh, and, uh, and it is one of the things I, th- I think I ended up really admiring about her. Let's go to Cairo Street. This is the, uh, the uh, Colombian Expo- uh, Exposition. It's 1893. And there was belly dancing on Cairo Street. How did this become part of Ida Craddock's history? This is a great scene uh, at the World's Fair uh, there in Chicago, which is just this huge fair. And the controversy centers on these entertainments on the Midway, which is sort of the circus element of, this, uh, of the fair there, and, and especially on the Egyptian theater where belly dancing is going on. And the word gets out, and various reformers there in Chicago call on Comstock to come to Chicago to see this belly dancing, and he, of course, is outraged and wants to shut it down. And he, he launches into the crusade and saying, you know, this just can't go on. This would never happen in New York City, and we've got to close this down for the, for the, for the sake of Christian civilization. Uh, for the very survival of this, these, these Christian uh, moral underpinnings for the country. Craddock c- comes into the picture at this moment when Comstock is most enraged about this and comes to the defense of belly dancing in the pages of the New York World, which at the time is one of the, the, the really big papers there in New York. That would have and, been like a TV station and an Internet, uh, a huge Internet page altogether. In New York <laughs> exactly. Right. right. This is a media sensation. She comes out, she publishes an essay in the New York World. The New York World has a great eye for controversy. She comes out as a defender uh, of, of belly dancing and claims that, uh, you know, the show should go on in Chicago. And what's more, it should go on because uh, it has uh, religious and educational significance. People should uh, be able to... Uh, uh, learn more about their own bodies and the sexuality through dancing. There's no reason to suppress this. Um, what's more, because she studied the early history of religion, she's very uh, concerned about the, the relationship between religion and fertility and fecundity, and, and so she has all of that to, she's drawing on as well. And, you know, needless to say, Comstock and company were not expecting someone to come to the defense of this, I mean, they'd, they'd sort of, you know, come to the conclusion that no right-thinking person could, could, uh, could see it that way. And instead, they have a, a young woman who is in her 30s, and she's not married, and then in a small paragraph that uh, Lee explains, she uh, it presents herself as married to a, an angel? How does she say it exactly? Right, yeah, this, this is... This is a major turning point for her, too. She's trying to explain why it is she would know so much about sexuality, why it is as a single woman she has some authority to speak on these matters without seeming simply to be a dissolute person. Right, the marriage bed and the proper conduct between woman and man, that's sort right. Of thing. I mean, so she, she wants to explain this, and so she says, well, this is, this is a visionary knowledge. I mean, I know this through my, my spiritualist uh, uh, experiences. I have been in contact with the Spirit 
a variety of spirits, but this one in particular, Soth, who she sees as the as this as the angel figure of this young man who had courted her and then had died. Right. And so it's this this love affair that has come back to life spiritually or in a kind of dream state or a visionary state. And that explains why Comstock is free to accuse her of witchcraft when he arrests her in 1902, spectral R- crime. In other words, R- we've not shaken the original problem of the witch trials of the 17th century here, Lee. Right, right. I mean, it is interesting that that comes up and that he, he thinks that, uh, you know, there's something demonic about it and even kind of floats that. I mean, at that point, he's, he's looking for any and every reason to discredit right, her. Right. Uh, and, you know, so, well, maybe it's this. Maybe there's a... Sort so of so they, cross, they cross swords in sixteen uh, in uh, 1893, and I use, right. the, I use the imagery correctly because Ida goes on to write a uh, history of the phallic symbol and try to explain how it is that men came to dominate through the phallic symbol. That gets her into more trouble. Uh, in those intervening nine years, she is always being pursued by Comstock from city to city. She becomes someone that Comstock is going to land as if he's the, as, as if he's the, uh, the, the Inquisition. Right. I mean, there is that, that sense. I mean, he loves these images around prey and traps, and he does, I mean, as, as you mentioned, he has these decoy letters he sends. He, he does really think that, you know, he's going to trap her, that there's a kind of prey quality to this. And... Yeah, and he does. I mean, he or those who are working for him uh, tr- uh, arrest, have her arrested in Philadelphia, then uh, that pushes her out of the country for a while to London. She comes back. All the same problems are there. She goes to Chicago. She's arrested again. She ends up migrating to Washington, D.C. for a while, is run out of Washington, D.C., and finally lands in New York City. And then, you know, she's right there on Comstock's own turf. And in some ways, I... I I think you can see from the letters she's really expecting a final showdown. She wants a final showdown. And that it's kind of yeah, and, enough is enough. I think right, and that begins in February of 1902. Heaven's Bride is the book, the unprintable life of Ida C. Craddock, American mystic scholar, sexologist, martyr, and madwoman Lee Eric Schmidt, a professor at Harvard University, is the author. And we're not going to tell you the end, other than the fact that it's a surprise and it's tragic and it's terrible. I'm John Batchelor. This is the John Batchelor Show. Thank you.